It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a bird nerd. And joining me today to talk birds and particularly the amazing lyrebirds of Australia and much more particularly the Albert's lyrebird, the lesser known one, is Fiona Backhouse. And Fiona's doing a PhD at the University of Western Sydney. Fiona, welcome to the Bird Emergency and thanks for being involved. Thank you for having me. Now, tell us in broad terms um, how you got the idea for your uh, for your project and how are you doing it? That's a very good question. So I actually saw an ad for a project on Albert's Lyrebirds. Um, so my supervisors have worked on superb lyrebirds for quite a while. Um, they are the lyrebird lab, that's what they call themselves. Um, and they were interested in looking at the Albert's lyrebird because we don't know a lot about that species and they wanted to know how that compares to the superb lyrebird. Um, and I came across this um, ad for the project and I thought, lyrebirds, that's pretty cool. I wouldn't mind studying them. I knew I wanted to do a PhD. Um, I knew I was interested in animal behaviour. Um, I also enjoy music. I um, did a lot of music growing up, so I was interested to see how can I combine music and biology. The answer is birdsong. Um, but I was also really interested in conservation, so I thought how can I approach this from a bit more of a conservation angle. Um, and so instead of looking at how the Yalbert's lyrebird compares to the superb lyrebird, I've been looking at the kind of diversity that you find within the Albert's lyrebird. So, well, I think most people are, are quite familiar with the amazing vocalizations and the abilities of the superb lyrebird. And I'd be surprised if there's many bird nerds who haven't seen the David Attenborough BBC footage of one lyrebird in particular. Um, how different is the Alberts when it comes to uh, its calls and the, abil the abil ability for mim mimicry and how they display compared to the superb lyrebird? So there seem to be a lot of similarities. Um, both lyrebird species, they obviously mimic, uh, but they have a lot of other vocalisations as well. So... Um, both lyrebird species have their own song that we call the whistle song, and that's kind of like their territorial signal. It's um, a very loud ringing call that you often hear from further away than the rest of it. Then they have the mimicry. That we sort of call it the recital mimicry um, because it's performed in this long string of different mimetic vocalisations um, without much interruption. Then they have... Another sort of vocalisation, which um, in the superb libraries is the dance song, sometimes known as plicking. And that's that really bizarre kind of laser-like sound that people often hear. Um, Albert's libraries have something that seems to be the equivalent, which is called gronking. And that's a very sort of rhythmic, almost percussive sound. Um, and then both species have another set of mimicry that they do after either the dance song or the gronking which is sometimes called buzz mimicry, and that's mimicry of a, a different set of species. Um, it's often alarm calls in superb lyrebirds. Um, our lab has just published a paper showing that in this other set of mimicry, they mimic mobbing flocks. So a mobbing flock is basically when a bunch of different birds of species get together and they do alarm calls and try and chase off whatever predator is there. Um, so they're, they're similar in having like the same categories of vocalisations, but the way they perform them is a bit different. And I, I was reading some of the papers you, you, you sent along to me, and it seems like different populations of, of the Albert's lyrebird are quite distinct, but they, they all seem to have the same song structure but they have variations in the way those songs are const uh, not constructed, but 
uh, performed. I think that's probably the best way to say it. So can you explain the structure of the of the song? Yeah, so uh, the song you're talking about is the whistle song, which is also known as a territorial song. Um, and that's this very obvious loud song that they do. And basically in all populations, they start off with an introductory note or a couple of introductory notes. And this is often mimicry of other species. So um, in some species, they mimic a king parrot vocalization. In others, they mimic a, goss, a gray goshawk. Um, I've also heard Eastern Yellow Robin, um, so, which is quite cool. So do we know or have you, have you got any theories about um, what, what a, an individual live bird is trying to say? Um, ha, are we able to, to anthropo Pomorphise, what's the word, um, to that extent? I mean, sort of, because it's actually fairly common in um, bird song to have introductory notes or syllables in the song. Um, and they're often quite loud and very simple acoustic structure. So they sort of, they travel well through the environment and they're basically a signal saying like, hey, I'm here, I'm about to sing, listen to me. What's weird is that Lyrebirds are using mimetic sounds for this introductory note. Um, are they so, are they on, are they only using birds for that uh, for that um, that that thieve that plagiarised notes for the introduction, or are they doing are they doing chainsaws and and things like that that they're also hearing in the environment? As far as I'm coming across, it's only bird songs, and it's also um, a very limited set of, of bird vocalizations they're using. Um, and they all seem to have a similar acoustic structure. So they're all sort of, uh, they're all what we call elements. So an element is just one basically note. They're a single note, they're around a similar pitch or frequency, and they're very um, short as well. So that you can use a few different species, but the sort of acoustic structure of that call is similar across the range. Okay. Well, it seems that the Albert Slybird population is very fragmented. So can you tell us about where, where they're occurring and then are the males in the different areas isolated from contact with the males in the in other adjoining populations and are they learning from each other or are they making up their own song, I guess is what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start by talking about their distribution. Um, yeah. So for those who don't know, Albert's lyrebirds are found in a very small area. So while superb lyrebirds are found along much of the east coast of Australia, Albert's lyrebirds are found basically on the border between New South Wales and Queensland. So in the Gold Coast hinterland area or the scenic rim um, or the Tweed Valley, whatever you want to know it as. Um, and in that area, they're basically confined to the higher mountain ridges where there is remaining rainforest. So I believe a lot of that area used to be covered in rainforest, um, but it's a lot of it's been cleared for farmland or for housing. Um, and so it's quite fragmented now. And so, the sort of amount of fragmentation or the amount of isolation that different populations are under depends on where they are. So there are some areas um, like around Lamington National Park and the Border Ranges National Park, which are still fairly large, um, intact areas of rainforest. Then you get other places like Tambourine Mountain, which is very isolated. Um, there's only small pockets of rainforest left there and it's completely cut off from the rest of the range. So those males are unlikely to have any contact with um, the rest of the broader lyrebird population. Um, we do believe, so um, songbirds in general learn songs from other birds. It's been shown in a variety of species that if they're raised in isolation, their songs are different. Um, they're often quite degraded. We haven't shown that with lyrebirds, but we can kind of assume they're doing the same thing with their whistle song. The other reason why we're pretty sure they're learning from each other is because 
all songs in one area are the same. So they sound very similar. And are they, uh, so they're, they're learning from each other if, and they're not, uh, they're, they're not, sort of pushing their uh, vocalize, vocalizing ability to the limit. Uh, they're not show-offs or, or, uh, or extroverts in a musical sense. Well, it's interesting you say that because you would think um, because they have these amazing mimetic repertoires that they can sing such a variety of sounds. But I don't think they're necessarily very good at improvising. So everything they sing, they've learned from something, whether they've learned it from other lyrebirds or whether they've learned it from another species. Okay, so they're they're not going to be um, uh, breaking out a new a new symphony. <laughs> that, um, does that does that mean that over time, their the scope of their vocalizations is remaining static? or is it growing, or do you think it's decreasing? Have you got any evidence for any of those? I I don't. So what I have is a snapshot of what's been happening in the last couple of years in the populations. Um, what would be really nice is to compare repertoires from the same area from old recordings. Um, I think I, I know there are some recordings from around the 80s um, done by Sidney Curtis, um, and it'd be interesting if somebody went back in 20 years or so um, and recorded them again to see Absolutely. what's going on. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell us a bit about the the, the behaviour, um, the ecology of the lyrebird, and then we'll try and, uh, try and see how the work you're doing um, and, and the previous work can inform conservation decisions, um, apart from the obvious one of stop cutting down everything in the in the jungle. So. Yeah, so um, other slivers, all livebirds are mostly ground dwelling. Um, they they forage on the forest floor. They sort of scratch and they turn up heaps of dirt and they look for invertebrates that are there. Um, they're also they're very sedentary, so they're very loyal to one area. They don't move very fast. So lyrebirds are territorial. Um, as far as we know, the they have the same or similar territories every year. Um, and are they, they, uh, uh, sorry, it, it, is it dominated by one sex or, or do males allow multiple females in their territory? Do, do we understand that? I don't think we really know what's going on with that yet. Um, it's actually, it's quite hard to know what the females are doing because they're so cryptic. They're not loud like the males. Um, you have to rely on seeing them. Um, I believe in the superb lyrebird, they're often actually thought to live in slightly different areas. Um, so I think the males are often on the escarpments and the females are a bit lower in the gullies where there's more food for raising her young. With the Albus lyrebirds, we don't know what the distribution of males and females are. Um, mm. But it's likely there is some crossover um, with the territories, some overlap. And um, are they polygamous? What What's their sort of breeding behaviour? So uh, females are the sole carers of the young. So once they've found a male that they like and they've mated, she goes off and she does everything on her own. She builds the nest on her own. She incubates on her own and she raises the chick on her own. The males will stay in their territory and they'll display away and they'll basically try and attract as many females as they can. Um, beyond that, that's that's all their involvement. So with, with that kind of behaviour, can we assume that a male has a large territory and because he's in the less choice country and the... Uh, and the females, because they're lower down in the uh, in the ha in the habitat or in the uh, uh, in the gullies, whatnot, with more food, that they have smaller territories, so that a male has potentially more more females to choose from 
than the females have males to choose from? It's an interesting question. Um, I suspect it's it's not quite like that. I think that females actually go roaming to find a mate. So they don't rely on having males within their territory. Um, they probably won't go too far away, um, but I don't think you would, you know, find one male that has several females within his territory I, because they still require the same amount of food. I think a lot of this would be, you know, how, how much of an area can an individual defend to maintain its food supply? So that's a good question, Fiona. How, how big an area can a male live bird defend? Um, so I have found on average about 300 metres between my males. Really? Um, so so what, do you, have, have you got a square metre average of, of, of the size of your territory? Let me, let me do a very quick calculation. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 all, all, all of these numbers are sort of a mo movable feast, but um, the, the I'm, I'm guessing that the population density uh, is not determined by the size of the territories, but more likely the available habitat. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, so it depends in sort of what sort of context you're talking. I, I believe the... Um, Estimates of population size are done based on the average territory size. Um, Fit, fitted into the available appropriate habitat. Yes, exactly. Um, but I, I do think in some areas you probably find more lyrebirds crammed into particular areas than in other places mm. they might be more spread out. So you're not going to find the same density of lyrebirds across the range. I mean, it, that that would be too easy. Of course, yeah. there's going to be, uh, of course, there's going to be a different carrying capacity in different areas. One would one would expect, and um, uh, I would doubt that the species mix of the vegetation would be homogenous right through the the appropriate habitat. Yeah. Um, especially as it is so disjointed, and and there's separation between our Elevations is that all? What is it always? Elevation um, that separates the the males from the females uh, in general. I I don't I don't think so. I um, I think that's kind of anecdotal reports, and nobody's really assessed exactly what's going on. So how? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's it, your your work sort of number of. Uh, really significant challenges to overcome. One is that you've got the populations that are so um, uh, di distributed so far away from each other. Even though it's a condensed area, it's um, uh, those roads up there. I mean, it's a long drive to get <laughs> to get yeah. anywhere in that in that region, and the um, uh, just the it's pretty rugged getting up and down some of those slopes. So how are you doing the field work? What's the, what's the actual method that you're using? Um, my method is basically I, well, first of all, before I went into the field, I, I did a bit of research. I looked at um, occurrence maps on things like the Atlas of Living Australia, just to see where other people had found live birds. Um, I got in contact with some people that, knew a bit about Albert's lyrebirds and where to find them, and I sort of identified hot spots um, of lyrebirds. And then basically I went there. Um, I got up very early in the morning and either went for a drive or went for a walk and listened out for them. And when I heard a lyrebird, I was like, okay, that's that's my first lyrebird. Let's get as close as we can um, and try and get some nice recordings. Did your, did your assumed hot spots before you ventured out into the field match up with uh, the hot spots you found it, for real? They did in general, although sometimes it is a bit harder to find lyrebirds than you assume. So um, lyrebirds actually, well, we, we think that they arrange themselves into what are called leks. So males will actually kind of group together and you might find an area that has um, several territories and then next to that, there's no lyrebirds, even though it looks like 
perfectly good habitat. Um, so I might go to a place sort of within, let's take the border ranges, for example. Um, I'll pull up somewhere along the road. I think this is a nice place to pull up. Let's see if there are any live birds here. And you listen and there's nothing. And then you drive another sort of kilometre or so off the road and you found a group of live birds and then you can, you know, record several all together. So is the distribution of the females dependent on the occurrence of these leks? It's possibly driven the other way around. So um, all females want to raise their young, essentially. They, they need to have a territory where they can support themselves and where they can support their offspring. Males want to attract a female so they can pass on their genes. And so it's more likely that the males are driven by where the females are. So it's, 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 perplex it's perplexing that there's... Uh, no, that, that you're finding anecdotally no lyrebirds in suitable lyrebird habitat or no male lyrebirds in suitable yes. habitat. So um, does that... Because uh, in, in the non-breeding season, do, uh, is there, are the males going, uh, like, spreading out? Because it their territory... Is from what we were discussing earlier, is probably has a lower carrying capacity than the females' territories. So I'm wondering how all the males hang out in, you know, in the in the in the worst neighbourhood, yeah. um, but at a higher density. Um, yeah, that, I mean, we we do think their territories kind of break down a little bit. Um, in the non-breeding season, you often okay. see. So, so during the breeding season, you'll only ever see one live bird together, unless there you've got a couple of males having a territorial dispute, or you've got a male and a female together. In the non-breeding season, sometimes you see groups of, of two or three, or even more live birds together. Um, so there is sort of some, you know, anecdotal evidence that they're using different areas in the non-breeding season. Okay. What season do the Albert's lyrebird breed in? Um, it's quoted as sort of March to August. Um, I think March is too early. I've been up in the field in May and still not heard anything sometimes. I think the peak of it is across June to July, um, but they do start in sort of peaking up in May and they will still go during August as well. Um. <laughs> This is probably way outside the scope, I would say, but um, do you know if there's a trigger that commences breeding? Is it rainfall events or is it like a um, uh, an eruption of, of insects or something like that? Uh, it's – I think it's temperature dependent. I think once it gets colder, um, then the, the, the display season starts. That's over the coldest months. Um, but female live birds will actually lay their eggs a lot earlier than other species. So they they can be laying their eggs, you know, in the middle of winter um, and you'll have chicks hatching as early as August sometimes. Um, and, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure why they breed so early compared to other birds. There's some thought that they display in the winter because fewer birds are singing then and so they kind of have this, you know, they've they have the pools. They've got they've the got stage, the, exactly. They've yeah, got the spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and and actually that was another thing that is uh, a point of difference between the two species, uh, where the superb live birds, I've been lucky enough to see the display a few times, um, they sort of scratch out a big area, which is nice and nice and clear and then and then do half a mallee fowl. You know, they they they, they make a little hummock. Um, mm -hmm. a mound or whatever to uh, to stand on so that everyone can can see them. What does the Albert's male do? Yeah, so Albert's lyrebirds are different, which is sometimes annoying when it comes to finding them. Um, instead of making themselves a little clearing or a mound, um, they actually use what is called a display platform. 
and they use bits of vegetation that are already in the forest. So this often means vines. They'll often be like a, a sort of patch of vines that they actually use in their display. Um, sometimes where there aren't vines available, it'll just be some fallen sticks or branches. I've also seen them using tussocks of grass. Um, so so they, they like to get a bit elevated. I'm not sure that it's so much elevation because sometimes it, it is on the ground, but they just have three or four really nice vines crossing over that patch. I think it's it's this vegetation that they can use in their display that's important. Okay, how how do they how do they use it? Have you can you characterise that? <laughs> so when they're dancing, they'll actually grab bits of vegetation with their feet. So sometimes it's a vine, um, and they'll move it while they're dancing. So sometimes they'll grab a bit to the side and they'll shake it. Sometimes they're standing on it and they'll just kind of gently move their foot up and down. But what you get, especially when it's in a nice big clump of vines, is that this whole area of vegetation will start shaking and sort of create an even bigger visual impression than the bird by himself would do, which is really so cool. The so the male Albert Sly bird really wants to be a pop star, um, but the... Uh, but the superb lyrebird is perhaps the one that's been working the hardest in the studio, and it's got the clarity and the and and the range and the repertoire. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> um, now, uh, what are the main threats for the for the lyrebirds apart from human intervention? Who who's gobbling them up? Uh, lots of things gobble the chicks. <laughs> so, um, currawong, actually currawongs go for eggs. So, so eggs and chicks are where they're really vulnerable. Um, things like currawongs will get the eggs. There's also been, uh, footage of a grey shrike thrush getting a live bird egg. Goshawks, both brown and grey goshawks are also big live bird predators. Um, but they're also vulnerable to attack by foxes and cats. Um, so I of know that's... Yeah, there's been footage of, of foxes getting into live bird nests um, and I've definitely, I've seen foxes in some of my field sites and I've seen cats in some of my field sites, which is um, quite depressing. And it's it's possible they'd be, they would be able to get the adults as well. Um, yeah. But most of what we've seen is, is nest predation. Okay, so the adults being the size they are, which is, um, oh, what it's about what one kilogram. Um, <laughs> it's about the size just, of a chicken. Yeah, just just saying that they're, they're like a bantam with a with with a long tail. Perhaps um perhaps a leghorn with a yeah. with a long tail to give to give the overseas listeners an idea of the of the size. So we don't we don't really have much that takes on a, a bird that size apart from our introduced predators, do we? Not really. Um, I have seen, I, it was quite amazing. I was driving out of the field once and I saw a goshawk dive from the sky and then suddenly an adult lyrebird shoot out from the undergrowth, um, missing a few feathers. So sometimes big birds of prey seem to go for the adults. Um, but I think that must have been one very hungry goshawk. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Well, uh he wouldn't have to, um, he or she wouldn't need to um, grab a meal for a day or two if they'd got a live bird, one would think. Um, how about how about quolls? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose quolls are one of those really cryptic species that we also don't know a lot about um, in terms of their occurrence and their behaviour. And they're... There are meant to be quolls in some areas that there are Albert's lyrebirds. I know that in Lamington National Park they've been looking out for them. Um, but I think quolls are more scavengers, aren't they? So if they, I guess they would they would probably raid a nest if they found one. Um, oh, we'd, yeah. it, I think most of the most of the quoll research is uh, is being done in Tasmania, isn't it? And I don't know if we can really. Um, I mean, the the, the lyrebirds and introduced. Uh, species down there, so uh, I I don't know if we if we could overlay the experience there to to what you're what you're seeing, but um, I'm I'm wondering 
how you see the future because that part of um, Queensland and New South Wales has for a long time been, you know, pretty sparsely settled, but the um, the small holding, the hobby farm and whatnot is encroaching into that uh, that area. And I think um, the the weekend the weekend drive is really really popular in the in the valley. How do you see the future of the remaining habitat? I yeah, it's it's pretty dire if you think about some of that habitat being lost because it is such a small area. Um, but I know there are projects looking into conserving what's left and even um, revegetating some of those areas. Um, so, you know, before we can make any predictions about what's going to happen, we actually need to know more about the areas they're using, um, how many live birds there are and what their actual distribution is. Um, and there are currently some citizen science projects going on encouraging landowners in those areas to sort of look out for live birds on their property and um, revegetate where they can so that you've got more suitable habitat and, and particularly habitat corridors connecting some of the fragmented populations. So it, it all depends on sort of um, human attitude <laughs> and what, what people want to do. Uh, the, the citizen science projects that are underway now, um, can is it easy for people to, to get involved? Do you know... Um, what they're called, who's uh, who's running them? Yeah, so it's being run by Saving Our Species. Um, In New South main, Wales? Yeah. Yes, and I think the main project is called Trails for Tales. Um, so I can send a link if, if there's a way to put that up. Uh, at, actually, we're, um, we're speaking with uh, Linda Bell from Saving Our Species uh, soon. So oh, fantastic. So I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll grill her more on that. So yeah, I'll certainly put a link to uh, to saving our species from through the Department of Environment in New South Wales. Is there anything happening in Queensland that you know of? I I haven't heard of anything in Queensland. So this does seem like it's all New South Wales focused. Um, do we have an estimation of where the bulk of the population is on which side of the border? Probably Queensland, I would think. Uh, but I, it, it does seem, yeah, I, we don't know. The, again, we don't know the exact numbers, so we don't know exactly where mm. they are. Um, I suppose the, the biggest area that you would find live birds in, again, is that border ranges, Lamington area, um, which is kind of half New South Wales, half Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, it's, it's hard work working in, a, in an environment environment like a uh, a wet forest a rainforest in winter um, how do you, uh, how are you collecting the uh, audio samples and um, like how how big are your study areas uh, how much equipment have you got out there in the field trying to get an idea of the scope of the project so uh, most of my data uh, that I collected and most of the data that I've used is from handheld recordings. So I have a, a recording unit and a microphone and I, I spend every morning in the field, um, you know, getting up before sunrise and getting as close to these birds as I can and recording them. Um, but I also have some other equipment. So I have um, motion sensing cameras. And when I find display platforms or what I suspect are display platforms, I'll um, set the cameras up um, and I'm setting them up to record video uh, so often people will get photos but I'm trying to get videos in their display. I also have what are called autonomous sound recording units so these are little boxes with microphones and I can set them to record for a certain amount of time each day and I also set them up at the platforms just to get me some more um, recordings. Um, now live birds are actually pretty hard to work on um, they're very flighty, especially the Albert's Live Bird. Um, so 
if they know that you're getting close, they'll disappear. So you have to be you have to be really sneaky when you're trying to get close. Um, but often it's just I I don't manage to get close enough to get good quality footage. Um, so the scope of my research is I've I had five different main field sites and I collected data from about five birds from each site. Um, sometimes a couple more, but it's yeah. And the uh the sites that you you're working on are a long way from where you're based so how often are you able to make a trip up there and how long do you spend each time you're out in the field each time i went up to the field i i spent i uh, i stayed there for the whole breeding season so i was there for about three months each time just moving around between my sites um i was camping for most of it so <laughs> which was very cold um but quite an experience well, that's that's real field work, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that really opens up a a, a, a number of uh, questions for me, Fiona. It's like, um, I I know that area. So how do you, <laughs> how much supplies are you taking with you? You sort of for. Uh, in between each visit to the shop and how are you cooking on a campfire or are you uh are you taking a uh, a camper trailer or something like that with you i mean are you tramping or are you in uh, are you are you vehicle based i i was staying in a tent so um for my i had two two main field seasons the first one i had a nice big tent um the second year it was getting too much work to always put up and take down a massive tent, so I just had a little one. Um, but I had a good gas-powered camping stove, um, brought a little camping table and chairs with me so I can have a setup. And I would usually stay at each site for um, three or four nights. So I would get whatever I needed in terms of food um, or water. Most sites I had had water there. Sometimes I brought water with me. Um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. Uh, uh, I don't think anyone else I've spoken to has uh, has has been that self sufficient in the field for <laughs> long periods of time. Um, yeah, you might you might want to grab a, a swag, dispense <laughs> with the tent altogether. Um, yeah, wow. Um, keeping things dry if you're tent based, how? How are you keeping all of your equipment in good working order, notebooks, et cetera? That must be difficult. I mean, most of that lived in the car, um, <laughs> which which was easy. I had a nice big four-wheel drive um, both years. But I I was also in a way lucky that my, my two field season years were in the middle of the drought. So there was hardly any rain um, in 2019, which was one of my field seasons. And it's also... Um, the dry season in that area over the winter. So you don't get as much rainfall as you do in the summer up there, which made things easier. Yeah. Um, I, I should have asked this earlier on because I'm kind of going way, way, way back. But are, are the lyrebirds fruit eaters as well as uh, eating insects? As far as we know, I think... They just go for insects. I don't think there's any evidence of them eating fruit. Okay, so they're um, they're really, oh, I would think, quite dependent on the moisture levels in the uh, in the forest. Then, so is is drought a, li a limiting factor for their breeding success? Almost definitely, yes. Um, so it's, um, I mean, we don't really know a lot about Albert's lyrebird breeding success. Um, I did spend time looking for nests while I was up there and hardly found anything. So um, with the help of another sort of lyrebird guru, we did find a couple of nests one year, um, but really hardly anything. And I know in the Blue Mountains, so I've, there's someone in my lab who works on female lyrebirds in the Blue Mountains. Um, and she, I think she was finding fewer nests in the years that there were drought compared to after the drought, suddenly they were all nesting. Um, okay. So they really do seem to be rainfall dependent, at least with what they're trying to do. And do we know reliably what the size of a clutch is? 
One. One. So one egg. One, one egg, egg a year. So one carawong, one grey strike thrush, one butcher bird can be. That's it. Uh, that's so. I. <laughs> It's another question you probably can't answer, but it's one that really needs uh, needs an an answer from a management point of view. Is um, are the is the population replacing itself each year? Um, I mean, it it all it almost sounds like um, it almost sounds like that's too low to be able to compete with uh, fox foxes and cats on top of their natural predators that they're adapted to deal with and then the land clearing and climate change on top of that. Um, it seems a bit gloomy. It does seem a bit dire and uh, nest predation rates in live birds um, from, from what's been gathered can be very high. So it's, yeah, they actually... Um, Live birds have a very slow life history, so they don't start breeding until they're several years old. So I think males don't start um, breeding until they're seven or eight. And I think the youngest that a, a female has been observed to nest is four years old. Um, but they live for a long time. So once they reach maturity, they can have, you know, 10 breeding years. Um, and if half of those are successful, then one live bird has produced five more live birds. Um, so they they don't like to be disturbed, but do they tolerate people being around? Like if a land if a landowner has live birds on their property, do the live birds mind the landowner going about their business as long as they're not poking their noses into live bird business? There have, there's a couple of Albert's lyre birds that have been known to be a bit more um, approachable. So there was one lyre bird at uh, the Green Mountains section of Lamington National Park called George, who was apparently quite approachable um, and people could watch him display. There's also another lyre bird at Tambourine Mountain um, that I think a lot of people have managed to see because it's a bit more tolerant of other people. But in general, they're very, very elusive so even I uh, you know there might be live birds that um, live on the edge of somebody's garden but as soon as they hear somebody come outside they've disappeared yep I, so. I, I guess I guess what I was trying to to get to was uh, they're happy uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they're happy to live on the edge of your garden they won't let you see them but they're, they're not going to move on if as long as you leave them alone they'll they'll hang around if conditions oh. uh, are appropriate. I, I think if you have a vegetable garden on the edge of a patch of rainforest, you'll be able to get live birds <laughs> in your back garden. <laughs> Good. Just don't, just don't let your cat out if you've got one and keep your dog inside too. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, uh, they just sound like they're... Uh, Amazing to see. I've been lucky enough to see the superb live bird, as, as I've said. But uh, I lived in Brisbane for for a while and went on many expeditions looking to see or hear Alberts. No, no chance. Didn't know anybody who knew where one was hanging out though. So I think that's a a benefit. Now, what what um. What surprised you about the lyre birds so far from the work you've done? I think what surprised me the most is that, you know, lyre birds are known for being able to produce all sorts of crazy sounds. And that because of that, you know, wonderful video by David Attenborough that shows the mimicking of chainsaws and cameras and everything, we expect that they can mimic just about everything. What surprised me is they seem to actually be very selective about what they mimic, particularly Albert's lyrebirds. Um, so there's all sorts of different sounds they could be mimicking in the rainforest. But across the range, I've found um, with the populations I've studied, they're restricted to mimicking about 12 species um, 
in their sort of main mimetic display, which is not that many compared to what's in the area. Um, so who who are they plagiarising? Who are their favourites? <laughs> Big favourite is the satin bowerbird. Um, every lyrebird mimics multiple satin bowerbird calls. Mm. Another favourite is the king parrot, uh, crimson rosellas, eastern, rob eastern yellow robins, um, green catbirds are often mimicked. Um, uh, white-browed scrub wren is another that appears in lots of populations. And then more rarely things like uh, paradise rifle bird, Lewin's honey eaters, um, and log runners. Um, it's interesting, Albus lyrebirds, I, I think in some areas they do, but all of none of my birds mimic whip birds. But that seems to be a favourite of the superb live birds. Well, uh, I I read that um, really interesting paragraph in in one of the papers you sent me that the the live birds in Tasmania are still mimicking whip birds, uh, even though there are no whip birds in Tasmania. So yeah. that's uh, so that shows that the songs are passed down through the generations. Um, that's, yeah, that's stunning. Uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, have you got a favourite that you've been studying? A favourite bird? Yeah. No, if, if, or, or a favourite couple? <laughs> my my favourite bird is... Um, one of the males in Main Range National Park in the Goombara section. So that's one of their most northern populations. Um, it's an absolutely stunning area up there. I think it's my favourite field site as well. But there is this one male. Um, I think he was the first one that I found a platform for. And when I set up a camera, I got hours and hours and hours of footage of him. I think he's, out of all the birds I've filmed, he's one of the top performers. Um, so one morning I think he was... He was on his platform for, I think, three hours um, now, one morning. You, do you think he was aware of you? Uh, when I recorded him, he, he knew I was there. Okay. And he, he disappeared once I got too close. Um, okay. But in terms of actually leaving equipment there, they might notice it, but they don't seem at all perturbed by having cameras or recording equipment there. Okay. Okay. Um, are they? <laughs> do they have personalities? From what you what you've been able to ascertain, are they are, are are different birds that you've been watching display? Are they noticeably different in the way they behave? Uh, they are in that some of them are a lot more bold than others. So some of the live birds are notoriously difficult to follow. And as soon as, you know, on the edge of their territory, they stop seeing and disappear. Hmm. Whereas others you can get a lot closer to and they don't seem to mind as much. Um, again, this would probably just be a matter of, of opinion, but do you think that's because of a familiarity with with people that that those lyrebirds are in an area where they're more often in contact with people? I think it might be more to do with maybe the lyrebird's age or um, how how dominant he is. Um, if they have sort of dominance hierarchies, we don't really know about that. Um, but basically, if he's if he's a really top male and he knows that he can outrun a predator or whatever, he might stick around a bit longer. Because uh, sometimes, you know, within an area that would experience similar numbers of humans, you've got slightly different. Um, Responses of the live birds. Okay, when when does your project wrap up, and what are you hoping you will uh, uh, you will learn? Uh, I am actually in the final stages of my PhD now, um, so I'm trying, if possible, to finish my thesis before the next um, live bird field season begins. Um, but it's yeah, it's <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, right. well, but, what are the challenges with analysing all the data that that you have collected? Acoustic data is very difficult to analyse. So 
not only do you have to go and collect all the recordings, which takes a lot of time and effort, once you've got the recordings, you need to extract data from it. And so Relevant that takes, data. yeah, that takes our, well, first of all, you have to decide what you actually want from the recordings you've collected. And then it takes hours and hours of measurement to actually get numbers from that. Um, and you have to work out what are the variables you're interested in, um, what kind of sample size do you need, all of that stuff. Um, so it, it takes a long time. <laughs> now, for those of us who are not uh, disciplined scientists, how hard is it to make those decisions about what you include and what you exclude? It's quite difficult because, you know, often when you have um, behavioural or ecological data, you have so much that you can look at and you really have to focus on what is your question, what do I need to answer this question, and in terms of choosing variables, what do I think is most biologically relevant? Um, as well as robust, so I, I take acoustic measurements from my recordings, so that includes things like the pitch and duration of songs, but it can also include things like the amplitude or something called entropy, which is sort of the spread of the energy in that unit, in that, in that vocalisation. Um, and some of those are more robust measurements than others, so things like amplitude and entropy can be affected by recording conditions, so they're not as good to compare between recordings as things like pitch and duration. So you have to be, yeah, you now have to be probably, careful. <laughs> it's probably not a fair question to ask you on the fly. I probably should have uh, uh, pre-warned you with this, but but you, you mentioned you had to decide what are the questions that you want to answer and and the questions that that you're really putting the data to that makes sense what what are your what are the two or three major questions that you are attempting to find some kind of answer to oh yeah there's a, i mean there's a lot of questions and some of them are more specific and some of them are broad so um some of the broad questions that i'm hoping to uh, uh, answer are one of them is um what are the live ads learning from particularly with regards to the mimicry. So they learn the mimicry from the model species, the, the other species in the environment, or from other live birds. Um, and that could be done by asking questions such as, um, are the repertoires of neighbouring live birds the same or different? Is the way they sing their mimicry, so, you know, the order of the, of the mimetic vocalisations they sing, is it the same between neighbouring males or is it different? Um, another so, question I mean, sorry. No, go no, go, go on. I was just, I'll go on. I, uh, I was I've, just going to say another, another question that I'm trying to answer is um, what determines the actual diversity in their vocalisations, in an individual's vocalisation, what determines the number of species that he mimics or the number of vocalisations from different species that he mimics? Yeah. That, yeah. Is it? Is it age? Is it the proximity to other males? Is it uh, uh, is it their relative randiness? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so, how how do you think what you will find out can be applied to the conservation decisions that need to be made in the future? So. One of the things I'm trying to do is look at how um, sort of similarities in vocalisations between different populations of lyrebirds is related to the geographic connectivity of those populations. So we're trying to understand from a, a geographic perspective um, what drives the variation in this species. Um, and so then we can use that to understand a little bit more about how connected the live bird populations are. So are they moving between different patches or are they completely static? Um, and I think there's, there's a long way to go before we can apply this sort of um, acoustic or behavioural research to conservation. But I think this is just documenting the diversity that there is, is a good first step that we can take. So when you've written this one up, and and it's been accepted and and approved. 
and your um, uh, your doctor Fiona, uh, what do you think is next for you? That is the big question. Um, I would love to keep working on something similar. Um, it'd be nice if it was like with lyrebirds. I would also be interested in working with other species. Um, but I've really gotten interested in the sort of discussions of um, behavioural diversity and what that can tell us or how that can help us with conservation. So I'd love to sort of keep doing similar things, but from move even further into conservation. Do you think tracking is is something that will be applied to lyrebird research in the future? Because it's now become um, a bit more affordable, I think, to have the uh, GPS trackers attached to birds. Do you think do you think they'll handle um, being trapped and harnessed? The trouble with lyrebirds is they're extremely difficult to catch. Um, so they're they have luck catching um, superb lyrebirds in some areas, particularly um, there's a population down in Victoria where most of their catching involves um, getting birds at the nest. So the easiest birds to sort of capture and get data from are chicks and their mothers. Um, finding nests of Albert's lyrebirds has proved very difficult. Um, yeah. And I think capturing the males is also almost impossible. So logistically, that that first step of actually getting transmitters onto the bird is very difficult. Then the later step of getting the transmitters back would be um, equally difficult. So, yeah. so vi visual surveillance is a much more appropriate way to study the species. Or audio surveillance. Audio so what surveillance. a lot of, yeah, yeah the main way of actually um, censusing lyrebirds is by listening for the males because you, so you can count the males using that. So um, that sounds like that might be a good continuation project, uh, Fiona. Now, uh, you, you mentioned before before we started um, that you've got some uh, research partners uh, in this project. So do you want to give them a, uh, a shout-out and a, hey, thanks for your money kind of call? <laughs> yes. So um, BirdLife Northern New South Wales um, – very generously um, provided me with some money in my first year, which paid for my cameras, which got me some beautiful footage that um, is lovely to use. It's great for understanding the behaviour of the lyrebirds. Um, also makes great material for putting into talks and getting people interested in the species. Um, but we also have a partnership with some scientists at Cornell University in the United States. So they're interested in... Um, cultural evolution in birds in general and live birds are a very interesting species to do that with. So they're partnered with us. Um, we collect the data. Sometimes they, they send students over to help us collect the data and then we sort of analyse and write it up together. That's great. Uh, what cameras are you using? Just I'm interested in that. I've used a couple of different cameras. Um, there's a brand called Stealth Cam, which I've used. So I think the model was... DS4K, um, but our lab often use Bushnell's, um, the aggressor model, and they've proved to be really good. So um, they seem to be very, they can deal with um, rain and all that kind of stuff and take very nice quality videos. And I, I'm a bit of a, a, a sound equipment nerd. So uh, what's your handheld recorder and uh are you using a, a directional shotgun mic with a uh, with a parabola? Uh, so the the little recording unit is a Marantz. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head which model number. Yeah, it and then, doesn't <laughs> But it's a Marantz and then um, we use a shotgun microphone that has a, a softy over it. Yeah, um, yeah. But we don't have a parabola or anything. We just use a shotgun yeah. so we can get very directional um, sounds. Ripper, ripper. All right, Fiona. Well, now we have to get into the bird nerd uh, uh, spectrum part of the the show. What is your field guide of choice when you're out there in the field? That's a difficult question because I can't remember who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> What's on the cover? It's it's a it's a red cover. It's um it's one of the recent um 
<laughs> Birds of Australia books. <laughs> I should I should offer a prize for the pers- first person to hit me up on Twitter with the with the correct name. <laughs> I know it's, it's meant to be a favourite um, of of ornithologists in Australia. <laughs> I think I know the one the, the one you mean, and I think it is probably the most recent uh, new publication, not reissue, but new publication. So, yes, I I might do that. I might. Uh, I might offer a bird emergency T-shirt for the first person who hits me up on Twitter with the <laughs> with, with with the right answer. Um, <laughs> that's cool. What's your favourite piece of field equipment? Uh, my gaiters, actually. Um, yeah, I I wear gaiters. Um, partly, I mean, there's not much in terms of reptile activity over the winter, um, but there is some, and also there's just a lot of spiky vegetation and I feel secure with my gaiters on. <laughs> I feel That's I feel exposed. Actually, it's for the leeches that I wear. I was, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, every time I've worn them, it's it's to stop leeches because they're a bugger. And and ticks too, I guess. But, uh, yeah, um, that's the first. That's the first time anyone has said gaiters. <laughs> um have you got a favourite bird? Now, that's an, probably Ooh. an obvious question. All right. If, if we're going a favourite bird that's not the Albert Sly bird, it's the magpie, the Australian magpie. Um, I've always been fascinated by them. I think they are um, one of the most impressive songsters that we have, and they're incredibly intelligent as well. They're so personable. You can really understand the different magpie personalities, yeah. which is very but, nice. I have two families who... Um, duel over the park across the road from my house. So there's sort of a, a, a well, it's actually an east and west uh, families. Uh, one of them is dominant at the moment in the park, but their male is very, very nasty. Right. He, is he a swooper? He, uh, he's not so much a swooper of people, but he will not tolerate wattle birds. He won't tolerate honey eaters. He... He's overwhelmed by lorikeets, but he doesn't like them. He won't let the galahs near. The the, corral, the corellas bite back, so he sort of tolerates them. But <laughs> he's he's really nasty. Uh, in the ebb and flow, when sometimes the other group get to use the park, their male doesn't seem to mind anybody. Oh, there we but, go. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they do have very definite personalities. Um the mothers are very good mothers, or or the mother in the in the group I've got now is a very good mother. She takes all the chicks under her wing. She's she manages to do three or four every year. She's oh wow! Pretty, yeah, she's That's pretty impressive. amazing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, they're talking about your favourite bird. It's mine. <laughs> um, what's on your bucket list in terms of birds? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, probably penguins, any sort of penguin. I've, I've seen fairy penguins when I was a kid. Um, Have you I'd been to the see... penguin? Did you go to the penguin parade as a kid? No, these were, I think there were some penguins at, um, near Bishano in Tasmania okay. that I saw. Okay. Well, if you love penguins, you have to go to the penguin parade. That's you can't beat that on Philip. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, it, it, it's pretty dorky, but it's 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 pretty fun. And is there is there like a location that you are absolutely hanging out to get to? South America, <laughs> anywhere in South America. <laughs> I think really? they have some. I think they have some really really wacky birds. Um, yeah. around there and some of the highest diversity of birds in the world as well. Yeah. Yeah. Have, um, but are you looking for forest birds? Are you looking – I mean, are you wanting to go for, out yeah. on, the, on, on the steps? I mean, you, you're looking to go to the jungle, aren't you? For, yeah, I would think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you can go to the uh, Atacama Desert or whatever, whatever you want, but you ain't seeing any macaws there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, where is – your favourite spot 
that you have gone birding or like to go birding? Uh, so a few years ago, I had the absolute privilege of working on an island or an, an archipelago of islands called St Kilda in Scotland, um, which is a little, little group of islands way off the west coast of Scotland, and it's a major breeding ground for all sorts of seabirds. Um, so, so they have so you've seen, puffin colony, you've, they have gannets. <laughs> you've, you've seen the puffin. I have. That's why, I, if, you know, if I hadn't already seen puffins, that would have been my um, bucket list bird. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a favourite of, of so many people. So um, do you maintain a list? Do you know your number? I do not go that far as having a list. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of I, I appreciate birds when I see them and I like sort of um, to, to know what I'm looking at. But yeah, I haven't so, really kept track. <laughs> um, so on a... a on a day out in the field, you'll happily sit and watch um, a group of scrub wren, scrub wrens go about their business, rather than you've got to trek for another uh, another four kilometres yeah. to get the next one. Well, I I've always loved animal behaviour. So if if I'm out in the bush or out in the field, my favourite thing is to just observe what's going on. Not necessarily to look for as many different things as I can, but to just see what they're doing. Well, so maybe extent. my bucket list is bird behaviour rather than bird species. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, let, let's extend the, the questions a little bit further than, than I normally do. Uh, are you more an animal nerd or are you now firmly a bird nerd? I'm definitely animals in general. Okay. What's, yeah. uh, what, what do you want to study or what is the favourite that you've already had it? <laughs> had a dip at? I, I've, I'm yet to study anything that's not a bird, which is why I think I often fell under the umbrella of, um, of birds. Um, I I would love to study quolls, actually, or Tasmanian devils or something like that. Um, oh, you're going to have to relocate, aren't you? <laughs> Tasmania, what a shame. <laughs> yeah, Beautiful well, place. That's right. Um, a couple of extra pairs of, uh, of britches. So you can wear three at a time. So I mean, um, I never forget when I moved to Brisbane and it was thirteen degrees, and I'm still walking around in shorts and a t-shirt. And my housemates were were actually going out to buy long johns and were wearing uh, <laughs> wearing two two woolen jumpers. And I'm thinking, wow, this is this is crazy. <laughs> but, yeah, it's. What um, w would you move to Tasmania? Yeah, yeah. I like the cold. Okay. I think Tasmania is beautiful. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. Anyone who's got um, a postdoc project in uh, in the carnivores of Tasmania, just keep Fiona in mind. <laughs> <laughs> right, Fiona. Thanks again for um, speaking to us, giving us so much of your time. What what's your timeline for your project now, and will you give us an update when you've uh, when you've completed it, when you've handed in your homework? Uh, let me just check what's the date today. I think my timeline is to submit in about five and a half weeks from today. Fantastic! Um, so. <laughs> so it's getting very close, and I will most definitely post about it when it's done. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, I, I hope you'll give us an, an update. Um, I want to I want to get into the habit of, of reviewing when people publish, but I always I always miss it. So <laughs> so make sure you let me know. Will do. Uh, okay. Well, um, Fiona Backhouse, that's been uh, an illuminating um, discussion. I. I feel I feel like I have to go and find track down that um, David Attenborough episode of the Liebird and uh, and have a look at it again tonight. Is, is there any good footage that you know of of the Albert's Liebird that people could hunt up? There's not very much publicly available. I mean, if you if you search Albert's Liebird on YouTube, there's a couple of nice videos of their displays that come up. Um, there's also there was a small documentary. Um, I'm just trying to remember who who made it. Um, I think it was 
co-produced by people at O'Reilly's. Um, and it's called Albert's Live Bird, Prince of the Rainforest, which is quite a nice, nice little film. Okay, well, I'll I'll hunt that down and uh, and <laughs> and put a link put a link to that because I think it always helps when we're we're talking about songs and displays, and of course we haven't played any of them, so <laughs> so people might like to to know about that. Thanks again, Fiona. All the best with meeting your uh, your deadline. I'm guessing Thank that's you. lots of lots of home deliveries and not too many uh, nights out. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks. That's been The Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. Thank you very much for listening.